Perfect. Perfect. Good. Thank you, Paul. So I'm really disappointed because when we when we switched the laptops, right up there in the corner was the you have updates, and uh, it went away on its own. Otherwise, I would have clicked on it and I would be doing updates right now, because I cannot help myself. Um, and that has nothing to do with what I with my, me working in security. It's how I work. So a little bit about me. I am Paul Dokus. I'm a security engineer. Um, that's my Twitter handle. You can you can look me up. I I rant about all kinds of things, um, random things. I try desperately to stay away from politics, but every once in a while it comes through. So I try to get, keep to security work uh, where possible, and all kinds of fun things that that go on every day. Um, as Bridget alluded to, I am. Um, an old school security guy. I graduated with a master's in computer science in 1990, if you can believe it. So I have, and I've been working in, I've worked as a programmer, I worked as a system administrator, and I've been doing security for upwards of 20 some years. So I have seen all kinds of changes in the industry. Um, I was uh, telling someone earlier, I missed the halcyon days when all I had to worry about were worms. It, the uh, NIMDA worm, I was thinking about that just the other day. Um, things are a little more complex these days. So let me start my slide deck with once upon a time, I went to DevOps Days MSP 2018. And there, I, I discovered that it was mostly developers, DevOps, ops people, relatively few security people. So it was really interesting to stand there and talk to people and listen to them and figure out, you know, ask them, how does security work in your world? How, how does it, how does it uh, affect you? What, what can you tell me about what you're, what you're going through? And I found some really interesting things. So what I'm going to do here today is sort of reflect on that experience and pick it apart and try to deconstruct it and then reassemble the notion of security in a way that those of you who don't do security can hopefully gain a better understanding of how it actually works and how it would affect you and, and also try to explain things from a security practitioner's point of view. Um, not being, having done this for a really, really long time, I've got, I've been, as a person, I've evolved through all the stages of, of uh, information security. Um, I shouldn't say all, most of them, I hope, um, and, and sort of understand a little bit more of the context of how things work, and specifically what doesn't work. So mind the gap. There are big gaps between what a security practitioner thinks and wants and what a more developer-oriented person wants. So what people told me, probably the single thing that I heard the most is, what the heck is this security thing anyway? I have no idea what they're talking to me about. They, they say things, and they might as well be speaking Greek. It's, it's, it was really interesting to hear that, because the language gap, for me, I mean, I've learned, I hope, to straddle in both worlds, having worked as a developer, and I still love coding. I do it all the time on my own, and I make all kinds of mistakes that, that I, the other side of me criticizes. Um, yes, I have arguments with myself sometimes. Another thing I heard a lot is, well, I applied the compliance playbook. You know, and, and that really points me toward there's the real dysfunction here. Something they've been told, the developers have been handed something, probably with no explanation, and said, just apply it. And then that, there's no context. I also heard, and, and this one I found particularly fascinating, because when you work in security for a long time, you're used to the ebb and flow. It's like the tide coming in and out. You'll find some days you'll come in and it'll just be an immense mess. Everything will come, come out and it'll be a you know, patch everything right now in a great big hurry. And other days there's nothing going on. And from a developer's point of view, who's more used to sitting around coding and really getting in the groove and getting in the groove for days on end, it, it's really disruptive. It's immensely disruptive. It breaks the chain of thought. You might as well go to meetings every other half hour. It's that kind of, uh, of problem. 
and a lot of people, what they specifically told me was, it feels like the goalposts keep moving on me. I did what I needed to do, and it changed from yesterday to today. I don't understand. Another thing I heard is, gee, that security stuff is just too complicated. This, by the way, is a map of the Tokyo subway. I want to go to Tokyo. Um, but, and it is, in a lot of ways it is. But, but what I hope to explain today is, it, it, if you shift the way you think about it, hopefully you can come at it in a way that drives the complexity out and you can simplify things a lot to the point where hopefully it's manageable. There's a problem in the security world, namely this. The security bus is going to run you over if you aren't careful. It oftentimes, in a situation of dysfunction, turns into a game of gotcha, which is really bad, really horrible way to run a security shop. If you're playing gotcha with people, you got bigger problems than, than you should ever have. It's got to be a partnership. Houston, we have a problem. There's a big gap in the way that people come at security from both ends, from all ends, to really understand what it is. And, and in my opinion, part of it is the fact that people have an old-fashioned notion of security that needs to be rethought. Um, anyone remember Project Jericho? Anyone? Yeah, Project Jericho was a humongous shift in the world. And I'm not going to tell you about it right now. Go look it up. It was, it, it, it's part of why that was one of the key points in my career when I really shifted from, gee, I really got to rethink how I approach these things. 97 or so, something like that. So again, there's clear differences in goals, priorities, expectations, language, all kinds of things. We have very different ways of communicating about things. So let's start deconstructing. Let's go back to basics. Start with the most simple thing. What is security anyway? Bank. We all agree it's more or less secure, right? You know, there's a building made of brick and stone. There's a big vault with giant door. There's tellers who, excuse me a sec. There's, there's tellers who keep an eye on your huge wads of money. That's impressive. Um, Bank of Taiwan, if I remember right. And, and, and police and guards with guns who are going to keep things secure. So where's the security? Is it the bank vault? Is it the teller? No. It's none of these things. None of these things are security. They are things that together make security. But none of them are security. So let's take it down a level, a more fundamental thing that people understand, a fortress. Let's go medieval. Is that security? No, it is not. If you don't have people manning the walls, people wandering around, walking the perimeter, um, people with armor and weapons and with a mission and training to impl impose that on everything, that's security. It's an emergent property. It's like gravity. It doesn't exist without something else. In case you're wondering, the emergent property is the property of a complex system that the individual components do not have. Let me restate that. Security is an emergent property. It is a thing that exists because of other things. So at its basic, most basic point, security is not a thing you Run a, you don't run a playbook and you get security. You don't scan your software and get security. You don't go through training and get a master's degree in information security and get security. That's not how it works. It's what you do. It's how you behave and how you approach things. To make matters fun, more fun, security is subjective. We all, I promise you, how many, we got about 100 people here. I promise you we got 200 opinions about what is secure. <laughs> It is entirely a matter of perspective. So let's back up. Doing it right. Now, before I dive into this next section, let me, let me just say th this came out of a conversation I had with, some, with a friend at, at DevOps Days. And so I'm ple piecing it together. It's not a perfect analogy. You, you'll understand why. It's not perfect. 
There, are, there are, were big problems in the industry, and, but let's tear it apart and look at how they approach things, OK? So ignore what they do, but let's look, tear it apart into its constituent parts. Let's have the mythical logistics company. So let's tear it apart and look at how they approach their work and how they do things, and let's put that into a security context. So what do they know? They know this, they're delivering things. So they know who shipped it, who's paying for it, how much was paid to ship it, what promises were made. In other words, you know, I promise it'll come in in good condition, or I promise we'll have you know people stomp on your boxes. And who is the recipient? And so they know all these things. This is what they fundamentally understand about their mission and what they're doing. Their first goal is to be aware of what's going on. They know what services they provide. And hopefully it's relatively few. I mean, a logistics company, what do they do? They, they, they ship things. They promise you, they make promises to you in terms of the, what they're going to do in terms of insurance. And they allow you to track things. That's pretty simple. Just they, they do three fundamental things. So let's step it back. In terms of the context of security, you know what you have, and you're you're going to make promises about how, what you're going to you know what you're going to do with them or offer to do with them. They understand their threats. A little bit more of security thinking in here. Always be threat oriented. Um, they they understand the threats: loss, theft, um, natural disasters like hurricanes. I mean, not that that's you know happening every other year here, not here in the United States. Um, and, and of course, political situations. They know what chances, are, you know, what, how often those risks are going to come up if they're doing their job right. And they know what they're going to do when those risks come about. What are they going to do when a hurricane rolls up the East Coast? I hope, I, I promise you, the big shipping companies, the USPS, UPS, have plans well in advance for when Florence was going to roll on land. They knew it was going to happen, and they had contingency plans. If they didn't, you know, they're, they're, they're not doing their job. And they know what they're going to do when those things happen. They have plans to roll out. So what do they do in terms of these things? They have an inventory. They, um, they have consistency. They think in terms of consistency. They're going to do the same thing over and over and over. They are going to automate things. They're going to be resilient in how they do it. They're going to recover quick. They know what they're, how they're going to recover. That's what I was after. And they're going to, of course, measure what they're going to do. So at the basic level, that is, think in terms of a, a, a logistics company. That's all you need to, this is, there's nothing special about this. This is how IT and tech companies do their job, too. There's no, no rocket science here. This is torn down to the basics. This is what they do. And I submit, in my opinion, that all it takes to have good, op good security is to have good operations. If you have good operations, in my opinion, you have reached above the 90% threshold. You are going to run faster than 90% of your competitors simply, run faster than 90% of your competitors in the security world simply by doing good operations. Okay. And I don't say this glibly. This is from experience. I've seen, I've been around for a while. I've seen a lot of problems in a lot of places. And I'll be honest with you, the vast majority of them come down to sloppy operations. Ah, I forgot about that computer. I stuck it on the internet. I needed to test some things. Oh, it's bridging the network to the inside. Oh, yeah. I needed that. I forgot about it. The that is the fundamental case for good security through good operations. And good operations what doesn't take much. Discipline, attention to detail, patience, relentless drive towards simplicity, and constant self-evaluation. Now, the key here is that um, good operations is a matter of slowing down Mindfulness is all the rage, or has been all the rage for a while. 
if you're truly mindful of what you're doing, the, this, this is not no, no surprise. If you haven't figured it out, I'm a big fan of getting to the heart of things and just trying to figure out what is the basic, what's the least common denominator, and how can we piece this together. And in my opinion, and this is one of the hardest things, is to have good security and good operations through good security through operations. You need to spend time doing operations. I've seen lots and lots of people put together the most amazing software, roll it together, have a button they can push to deploy it, and then realize that every single deployment that actually is going to do something is a snowflake. <laughs> Works great in the lab. They built it for the lab. I mean, if you're not spending as much time on your operations and doing the slow things, the, the slow mind things, then, then you're going to have, you're going to have security problems. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. I'm moving a little faster than I anticipated. Believe it or not, I got 60 slides. So at the heart of every security compliance regime is inventory. It's the very first thing you'll always find. And it's probably the single most frustrating thing of any operation that, that you'll ever find. Show me your inventory of computers. Show me your inventory. It's always the first thing they ask because you cannot protect what you don't know. You really and truly can't. Um, that computer, there was, a, there was a, a, um, an, a problem back, I can't remember what school it was, back in the late 90s. Um, they had this computer. It was running NetWare, and they couldn't find it. And they, they were digging and digging, and they can't find it. It was, it was owned, or so I don't remember what the details were. It was compromised, and it was ha causing troubles on the network, and they couldn't find it. And they finally realized, well, it's in this building. OK, it's on this floor. OK, here's the jack it's plugged into. Where does the wire go? Follow the wire to a closet. The wire goes through the wall of the back of the closet. And they discovered that someone had ordered up a room change on the closet. And the guy who showed up to drywall didn't know what he was doing. And he's like, there's a computer. Well, I don't care put a wall up and put the wire through the wall. Crazy things happen. And without a good inventory, you got to have it. Because um, the other downside of this from a security point of view is, you know, this is my personal laptop, not my work laptop. But my work laptop, thankfully, is encrypted. And But if it gets lost, I need to be able to, my employer needs to be able to prove it's, it's encrypted. It is. But without an inventory of knowing what, that the computer existed in the first place, and without knowing that um, it was also encrypted, you know, lawyers can argue amazing things. And some of the little details that, from as, as a security practitioner, um, that we, we always need, to really want to know, and people rarely have these in their inventories, I mean, besides the obvious things, what kind of computer is it? How much memory is it got? What, what is it? Um, MAC address, installed software, and a data. What kind of data is on it? It's really amazing. Um, well, I'll get to that last one in a moment. But MAC address in particular is really useful because um, there's lots of places that have registries of stolen computers. And you can give them the MAC address and say, that thing is stolen. And if it ever appears, like a lot of universities will do this. They have gigantic networks that are pretty open. And they will blacklist these stolen computers. And if they ever appear, an alarm goes off, and someone gets paged, and hopefully the police get called and go find the thing. If you're really doing it really, really well, and you're really well put together, the virtual inventory is very important as well. What computers you got? is great in the physical world. What computers you got in the virtual world? How many containers are there? What are their IP addresses? Uh, my, my particular specialty in computer security is, is um, uh, network intrusion detection. So all I have 
literally, at the end of the day when the alarms are going off, all I have is an IP address. And I say, that thing is compromised. And track it back and, and you know, you run it back and you find a NAT. Or you find an OpenStack cluster. Or you find whatever. It, it turns into a big problem because you say, well, here's the IP, here's the type, the ports. T tell me where, what, which instance that was. Well, there's one of them. If, as much as you can, it's really helpful to come back and understand your system and be able to describe it. And it's also worth noting that this is a thing that's really hard to do. I am fully aware of that. Um, the, on, it, it's really difficult. It's very easy in the physical world, but in the virtual world, do it as much as you can do it. Or at least understand where things are at and what your subnet allocations are. I mentioned data earlier. Data inventory is really important. Where it goes where, how is it put together. Um, I know that having data, um, knowing where your data is, knowing what data you have is often impossible to do. So do as best you can to figure out what, what kind of data you have, where it's at, because that's one of the first things that they're going to ask for in the, you know, if, if something bad happens. An interesting one that also is, is um, often missed is, is accounts, the inventory of accounts. Is, is really important. Um, the users' system accounts, the service accounts that you have, that's, uh, um, and, and how they're uh, authenticating and authoriz authorizing. So inventory is one thing. It's, it's a hard thing to do, but it's really, really important. It really is the foundation of, of dealing with what you have of understanding how to secure it, because you really cannot secure what you don't know. But also, complexity is, is a problem. A lot of systems these days are, are really complicated and really hard to deal with. Um, I deal with containers all day, every day. And keeping them straight is really hard. A question that often gets asked is, well, I, we got a 1,000 con containers running this thing. What configuration do they have? turns out to be a really hard problem. Understanding what's out there and how they're put together is, um, is difficult. So the simpler you can make it, the better off you're going to be. Again, nothing but good operations. Try to simplify it as much as possible so that you can actually wrap your arms around it. We're all only human after all, and doing things um, as simply as possible is going to make your life a lot easier because you will Every human has so much bandwidth to deal with things, the things in front of them. And if you're forced to deal with the subway system of Tokyo, you're going to have a hard time of it. So find those patterns and reuse them like over and over and over. This is Agile 101 stuff. But this is really one of the key things for building good security. If you can do things consistently, you will be able to notice the oddity, the thing that's out of place. It's like walking into a big building with a marble floor, and you look at the floor, and there's one tile that's crooked or different color. You go, ah, oh, hate that thing. But the only way to notice it is to actually be doing, is to build things in a consistent, repeatable way. And of course, you have to automate the crap out of things to make that so. Automate. Use it. Snowflakes are evil. They're evil in the security world, too, because they are the things that are going to be in the corner that are going to get compromised. Bridget and I used to work at a university. You know what the biggest thing about a university network is? It has one of everything. SGIs, SGI irises, the little purple ones, yeah, they're still there. They're probably behind walls. The, the, um, so yeah, consistency is the thing. Get, get automate. Uh, excuse me. Hang on a sec. Oops. Let me back up and find my place. So to to drive that consistency, automate, 
as much as possible. And don't let go. If you can't redeploy it over and over and over in exactly the same way, you haven't automated it enough. It's very important. Um, it's the only way to drive toward consistency. A key aspect of, of um, information security, of how to keep things secure, is probably one of the least understood, resilience. Resilience to me, how fast can you redeploy that thing? If, if your data center burst into flames, everything's gone, how fast would it take you to get new equipment, new, new place, get things back up and running? And that's not just for you know a hurricane rolling in. What do you do when someone comes in and erases everything? Or you get um, crypto, you know, you're, someone encrypts all your stuff with malware. You gotta get it back and fix things as fast as possible. And this is one aspect that I'm, I feel particularly strongly about in terms of good operations, um, which is practice over and over and over and over, continuously, tear things apart, put them back together. Um, the, someone once asked me, how's the best way to get into information security? And I said, what do you do? No, I'm a sysadmin. I'm like, reinstall your computers, your domain controllers, every day. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Reinstall them. Pick one. Reinstall it. If you can't bare metal that thing, you're, you're, you're not doing enough to get things up and running in a, in a truly resilient way. Because the only way you're going to get, as soon as you start doing that, doing it every day, you're going to automate. And you're going to drive the consistency as hard as you can possibly do it. Because you know what? Taking four hours to reinstall the DC every day is not fun. So you're going to get it down to 15 minutes. So practice. Practice, 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 practice. And that you might as well. It, it's not just for systems. It also applies to everything you do. The, the code you're writing to deploy those containers, to make those um, systems go up, up and run out in the cloud. There's a really neat thing. I'm disappointed to see that it was actually retired and they've, they've, they had a great thing going with the name, the Simeon Army. Netflix. Do you guys hear of Netflix Simeon Army? How many use it? I'm actually curious. Do you know what I want to ask? I see one hand. Anyone else? It's my dream someday to run a large cloud operation and just turn them loose. <laughs> I would love to do that. Um, and that is a great way to practice. Because you will discover, or I should say the monkeys will discover for you, all the inconsistencies in your code. Um, like I said, that's the link to the Netflix uh, Simian Army. It's, it's a retired project now, but they've replaced it with a couple other things. It's an amazing concept. I heard about that, I don't even remember, it must have been over a decade ago now. And I thought, that's fabulous. That is a great concept. We should all do that. And again, to drive resilience, to drive out complexity, to drive automation. Metrics, of course. We all agree. We all need it, right? Do the simple things. I don't care about the fancy crap that people want to do. I don't care about the basics, or I'm sorry, about the really f complex things that um, you're trying to measure. It may be very important to you. It may be very important to your customer. That's great, but do the basics first. If you're not waking yourself up at 2 in the morning because your machines fell over, you're it's, you're not doing the full job. And I mean it. Start with the simple things. Um, in part, as part of good operations, you know, it's that computer in the corner that's going to be the problem. How, why didn't you know it was getting rebooted as someone was testing out the rootkit? The machine was important to you because it ran whatever it ran. You know, your, your third cousin's website, who knew. But it's important to someone. Otherwise, just turn it off. Um, and make sure to log, wow. Well, I guess you can see my edits. <laughs> the, the last thing is what, what this was supposed to, this one was supposed to add. Log all your alerts, log them. 
because there's nothing worse than coming in in the morning going, well, it paged me. I don't know why, but um, need to figure out, need to capture everything. Um, and it's worth noting, Elk, um, super easy to set up, do it. You don't need um, you know, fancy, expensive SIM software. Just don't bother. Just log everything into, into even just a syslog collector. Just write it to disk. Doesn't matter. As long as you can come back and come get it later, that's really all you need. Pure and simple good operations. Something is just enough to get you through the next day when you need to reconstruct things. So I'm going to digress for a moment and talk about logs and logging. Um, this is a point that um, bothers me, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, because um, I've seen a lot of logs from a lot of systems. And um, you know, for all of you developers out there, have you ever had your security team come to you and say, yeah, I'd like to collect your si system logs? And, and you went, what's that? And you said, well, you know, the logs coming off your application. And, and then you're like, all right, if you want that. And, and, it, and you, then the security guy then proceeds to. And because what, what, you, what you got are debug logs. You've written the code for debugging. Now, uh, I'm not pointing. I'm not actually trying to point a finger here because this is a point that nobody ever really talks about, and and I want to try to pull back the cover a little bit on this one. So when you log things, answer the basic questions: when, where, who, how, what, and why. Try to answer all those things on a single line of logs, not as a stack trace. Please, I've seen too many Java stack traces. Um, and record them as single events whenever possible. So I'm a secure, I'm a Unix guy, so I'm thinking in terms of syslog here. But the same thing applies to to the Windows world. Um, and log them to somewhere with, that you can, like Elk Stack. Make sure to record them. And please, you can use more than debug. Please do. And in fact, let me, let me just digress for a second because this is such an important point. If you're writing code, you're writing and you're putting logs in, you're, you're, it's very important. You're debugging. You want to know the status of the system. It's debug logs. Wonderful. No question. Do it. But use the other ones for important things in your code, in your application. Information logs are, I, um, I did a thing. The computer, the, the program saying, I took this action on this thing at this time on behalf of this user. Um, notice logs, hey, that was an odd thing. Warning logs, um, this is not a good thing. You know, error, hey, the drives failed. Critical, well, critical is probably drives failed. Error would be, I, I, I give up. I can't deal with this data. Critical and then alert and emergency. Then these are bit. These are how this log works. Please use them. Be be aware, in particular, for your application. Anytime, what is when a security person comes to you and says, "I would like your logs. I would like your system logs." What they're saying is, "I would like info and above." And what they're saying is, "Info when your application takes an action on an object for, on behalf of a person at a time. Please log it." I deleted an email. I handled an HTTP request from someone. Um, someone changed the setting on an account. I changed, someone changed the password, that kind of thing. Um, so at least, please, start with info and, and move on. Um, the, uh, I'll be honest with you, the number of times I've ever actually seen anyone use anything other than debug, I can probably count on two hands in my career. And now we can finally talk about actual security things. Because everything that's come before this, and I'm not kidding, everything that's come before this is, um, is just simply operations. And if you've done all that stuff, then we can talk about the rest of these things. The firewalls you're going to need to do the work of keeping 
traffic segregated. The antivirus software you should be running on everything, especially Windows. Um, the the static code analyzers. I at DevOps days in in June we I can't. There were, I had several conversations with people about, well, I'm, I read static code analyzers. Isn't that enough? No, no. I don't care. You, know, you can write the most pristine code in the world and deploy it in a garbage heap, and it's going to be garbage. <laughs> it's just the way it goes. And also, my, my particular favorite, NIDS, network intrusion detection, host intrusion detection, that's my bread and butter. Um, and I intentionally put it very last. It's almost an afterthought. That's where it belongs in the scope of things. And, and, and SIMS also, security information aware, uh, security, inform, security incident event management systems. Don't buy one. Don't. Save your money. Spend it on hardware for an elk stack. I'm not kidding. Now, what I've done is gone through a big, long list of things. And, and I, I'm a security guy. That's what I do. But, and I'm, I'm constantly thinking of all the things, trying to cover all the holes of everything everywhere. And it's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, Bridget and I had a con I asked her to review my slides for this. And we had a conversation. And she said, there was an amazing quote that I'm going to get wrong because I don't have my speaker's notes. Um, um, security people expect 100%, and DevOps people think they're absolutely insane. And it's absolutely true. It really, truly is. Because there's no such thing as 100% security. There never has been. There never will be. And all you really need to do is be good enough. That's really all you need. So everything that, we've talked, that I've talked about so far, I've laid out big lists of things. Pick and choose. It's a play your own adventure. It really is. Pick something, get better at it, um, and, and move on. Then pick something else tomorrow and move on. Because that's what the world's like. So 45 minutes. How's that? Questions? Hey, Paul, uh, you mentioned that uh, there's eight logging levels. A lot of my day-to-day -day life is aggregating logs in a big corporation. Uh, two questions. One, how do you convince your devs that they actually need to log like info level stuff and not just errors? Give a talk at a DevOps and plead with them to please use it? <laughs> I, no, no, I mean, really, uh, again, what I said at the beginning of this is this is m largely a reflection on, on my experience at DevOps Days 2018. Um, I'm not here, I should have said this in the beginning, I'm not here to lecture you, despite appearances. Um, it's not my intent. So if there are good answers to that, I would love to hear them. Because, you know, it, it's a problem. So if anyone has any ideas, I'm happy to, you know, I'll grab a beer after this. So second question, if, yeah. if I may. Uh, so why do you think that is? Why do you, do you think that there's not an awareness? Time. Of like Time, pure time. and simple. Devs are under the crunch. There, there's, they got time commitments they got to meet to get the code out and running, to get it up and running properly, which is why you're putting debug in anyway. And there's also no incentive. Why would you put, you know, why would you be, um, um, uh, what's the right word? Why would you go the extra mile to be very, very, very consistent in your logging when nobody's going to see it if you did it all right? I thought logs I, were a feature. Logs are a feature. They're insurance. Um, I'm just guessing at this, but I think the answer to that question is uh, show the examples of where companies were penalized millions or billions of dollars based on not having that You know, oddly, um, there, that comes up on a fairly regular basis. And if you look at it, problems with security work Problems in the security world rarely stick. I, I, 
no explanation why. I have no idea, but it's it's apparently a fact. People have done research on it. I don't know. I'll actually kind of speak to that. Um, I was going to ask about log consolidation, and for the um, aspect of aggregating all the logs, um, I work in an environment that we orchestrate with all the different applications, and everybody's writing logs differently. So once you combine them, it gets almost impossible to read them. So yeah, <laughs> they're very, they can be really hard to 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 deal with. Um, in, in the security world, you keep your logs as insurance. It's so that you can go back and you can look at what was happening yesterday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because that thing happened. And um, that's, from a security point of view, the primary thing you're going to do. If you're going to use your logs for other things, um, a great way to approach them is treat everything as metrics. It's all numbers. Tra take your logs, chew on them, use something like Logstash to boil them down or, or fluid D, boil them down into numbers. I saw five of those in the last five minutes. And then just kick out those numbers. That's a great place to start. So you don't so you're picking and choosing the bits of the logs that matter and what's important and just simply turning it into a graph. And then when you see the graph that does that, you can go back and you can go, what the heck was happening? And pick it apart. I have a question. Uh, is there any sort of international standard or industry standard where you can reference some number and say, hey, I followed this procedure, so therefore, instead of just being kind of reactive and I did some testing, that I've really done a good job at creating a defense and depth depth no. security strategy? No. So once upon a time, and I'm going to, this is partially from hazy memory, there was a philosopher in the 1800s who was having an argument with a philosopher friend of his, these are famous philosophers, I cannot remember their names, if anyone knows, please shout it out. And they were having an argument about the depths to which you can prove things. And one of them said, I can mathematically prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Now, think about that. How would you approach that problem? How would you prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2 without saying, well, of course it's 2? He wrote a thousand pages picking it apart, inventing mathematics to prove that 1 plus 1, and he still couldn't do it. Drove him nuts. Com compliance is very much the same way. Compliance is, the, is the, um, the shadows on Plato's wall. If you, yes, I know what that is. That's a dog. That, that's clearly a dog. It's a shadow of a dog. That's what compliance is. Compliance is simply the roadmap you can follow to get something that is compliant. And if you read in depth and really read it in and read between the lines, you can build real security with them. Very few do. There's no, in my opinion, I've yet to see any um, compliance regimes that, are, that you can follow that would build you security. Like I posit here, security is mostly built from doing good operations so that you can notice those odd things that get out of place. I have both a comment and a question. Yes. One is that as a hacker, there are very few things that attackers like more than people who have checked a box for compliance and then left it there. <laughs> because hackers are pretty wily and like to you know, change things up. And if your compliance thing was last written in 2016, that can mean sometimes that you miss stuff. And that can be great for some people, but maybe not so great for you. Um, my question, though, was, one thing about having a lot of logs and keeping everything as metrics is that often, especially for people who are not security people, that can translate into noise. Yes. That there's just so much stuff that they see that eventually they just ignore all of it. How Do you have any recommendations for people who are trying to set up a better logging system so that they can lower the noise ratio or at least be able to get what they need to get out of that? Yes. So um, let me try to find it here. So. A dashboard is what you mostly need. Is the system up? Is it running? Is it doing it what it needs to be doing? That's where I would spend most of your time doing metrics. If you aren't looking at it and you think it's noise, stop putting it on a dashboard. You can still collect it without looking at it. Because remember, let me, let me back it up a second, give an analogy here to, to explain. When I was at the university, 
we did intrusion detection on the university network. And there's no firewalls. There's no nothing. It's just raw on the internet. So it was an adventure every day. And we used primarily Snort to do, to do intrusion detection. So my rubric of, of it was we were going to turn 100 computers off every single day. To do that, I needed 1,000 actionable alerts. Okay, so it's roughly a 10 to 1. Of that 1,000 actionable alerts, I needed 10,000 supporting alerts that would tell me more of the story about those 1,000 actionable alerts. Of those 10,000 supporting alerts, I had to capture 100,000 alerts per day to boil it down. In, in terms of metrics, I would treat it very much the same way. You care about the system is up and running. When it's not, you need to be able to debug it, and you need to know what's you need to be able to paint a picture of what's going on. To paint that picture, you need context. So you need, and for that context, you need to capture enough context about the entire system that you can build those individual contexts that cause that light to go red. So if you approach it in that with that mindset, and look at, look at your logs, your, your debugging logs, just throw them out. You don't need them. But if you find that you're generating Lots of logs that are useless. Like once upon a time, I saw an application that logged that took had, that did something. It took an hour to do it, and it would log every minute, going, "I'm X percent through doing that thing. I'm X percent through doing that thing. I'm X plus one percent through doing that thing." And it would do this forever. And because I, I, I noticed this because 90 percent of the logs were that. Oh, by the way, at no time did it ever tell you which thing it was doing. It just told you it was X percent through it. Throw those logs away. Go back into the code, change it out, and that, that loop should have been replaced with a log that says, I'm starting a thing, here's what I'm starting, and I finished a thing. You could replace that, all those thousands of lines with two lines. Yeah, hi yeah. there. Um, first, first I want to say thanks, and I really appreciate uh, taking the foundational approach to like sound operations uh, to get things started. Um, I guess either one of these that you want to take, or, or both. Um, one is, what are some of the foundational approaches to securing your humans um, and the people that are interacting with these systems? Uh, and then maybe another path is, uh, if you have some advice on when you're working with third-party vendors that are testing your ability to call yourself secure. Um, what are some of the things that you have in mind for either one of those? So let me take the second one first. Um, for third-party vendors testing you if you're secure, you're not. Be prepared to fail, which is perfectly fine. It's okay because you actually, if your third-party assessor is not finding things, they're not. You shouldn't be paying them because they're no good. You're either perfect, which is not true, or they are not doing their job. So. Prepare to fail. In, in much of security, one thing I didn't touch here is much of what's in security work is not being secure. It's how you recover from problems. And so incident response is king. You know, that's the goal. So it's not so much if you're secure, it's how you respond to being insecure because you're insecure. Um, I'm sorry, what was the first part? Oh, human security practice. Um, I don't have a good answer. Um, train people, boil it down. Some, one of the biggest problems I've seen in terms of um, good operations is the lack of discipline. Lack of discipline often comes not from people being stupid or you know, being not having their heart in it. It comes from burnout. The system is so complicated, I can barely manage keeping it up and running every day. I go home exhausted. I'm not going to build discipline. The simpler you can build the system, the better you can do your operations, the better you can drive the complexity out, the more you're going to make time for your humans to be disciplined. And notice that odd tile on the floor that's out of place. I, do, I honestly don't have a good answer beyond that. Drive the complexity out. Get disciplined. Train discipline. I don't have a great question, um, but uh, should I quote my applications to log in multi-part messages? Multi-part messages. My logging, yeah. Should I, should I, should so I log in multi-part? When in doubt, always one line. 
Thanks, well. When you can't, when you can't, which is perfectly okay, um, send mail is a great example of this, um, or postfix. What they do is they have to log multiple times because you're watching an email through its history as it crosses channels. But you need to link them all together, so it assigns an ID to that email. So you can do multi-line, just assign an ID, a session ID, an, an ID of the object, whatever it is, so that you can weave it back together across time. This is can you, okay. Connection through this time. Um, so the question is: a lot of teams, especially ops teams, kind of resort to firefighting where yep. things are happening and they don't have enough resources and they don't have enough time, yep. and they're blamed when things aren't up. Um, for firefighting teams, is there a place you would recommend starting for automation or for logging or whatever they? I'm they I'm a security engineer, and and I deal with the land. You know, my day, my day job is to deal with, with horrible. I am not a developer or actually an operations guy, although I used to be one. Um, so I'm not the right person to ask that question of. All these people are. Yeah. So I actually have a response to that, because we had that same problem in our company where we were all firefighting. And me and one of the first operation engineers uh, that we brought on, we just took a weekend and set up the Elk stack and just had everything shoot into that, and that's still what we use today. And that knocked the firefighting down by about 60 70% in a week because we could see what the system was doing. It was remarkable. And oh, yeah. Paul, do you want to explain what the ELK stack is? What, what is, sorry? Explain what the ELK stack is. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Elastic Logstash Kibana. Uh, Elastic.co. They're actually having um, their, their conference here this week. And their, their um, Elk, how can I describe Elk? Elk is a NoSQL database toolkit. You piece it together and you get all the components of storage and the database and indexing and you pick and choose and put it together. The base flavors are, are really good. It just crams te text into it, line-oriented text in it, rips it apart and stuffs it into indexes and you can do, it's like Splunk, but without all the features. <laughs> it does. It does and, and possibly without all up. the cost. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's free for hardware, and time. I mean, as long as your time is infinite, right? Well, you want your elk stack to not be yellow all the time. Yeah, this is true. I have run it in production. <laughs> There's a question in the back first. Hi, I'd like to uh, thank you for speaking tonight. That's very thank good you. speech. Um, I'm curious, do you have any favorites resources for keeping up to date on security? <laughs> it's the way it goes. Um, and, and I say that kind of facetiously, but, but it's really kind of true. You know, Twitter is, security is a hour to hour thing. I, you know, I don't know what's happened since I got up here. Um, the, it's, a, it's a great place. If you just go follow Pound InfoSec, it's a great place to start. Or, um, you know, depending upon your flavor of information security, I can point you to the trolls or the, or the pros or the uh, state-sponsored people. And, you know, you can find anything on Twitter. It's amazing. Uh, real quick, to the firefighting question, as an IT ops manager, and it looks like you were about to touch on it, the first thing that came to my mind was inventory. Uh, we are constantly struggling yep. with what we don't know yep. uh, because people are either sneaking something in or they're trying to circumvent the process to, to, to move quicker. Yep. And, you know, I, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm fairly good at reading rooms, and, and, I, and I noticed when I got to the inventory section of this, I'm like, yep, here we go. And, and people started checking their phones because, but, but it's true, secure information, or I'm sorry, inventory is so important, but it's the thing everyone hates to do, including myself. I hate it. It's awful. But it's also very important. Maybe they were tweeting about how important it is. <laughs> Somehow I doubt it. I might have been. Ha hashtag DevOps MSP. You should tweet about what you've heard here tonight. Okay, we have one more question, possibly. 
Yeah, just um, something you said near the end of the presentation. We were talking about how security can't be 100%, and I, I know that's, that's always true. What do you use, or like, how do you feel out what's good enough? Like, like I know it's a tough question, and it doesn't necessarily have an answer, but. Um, it's, in my experience, I mean, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I've been doing this so long. It kind of comes as second nature for me. I can kind of feel it, um, which does nobody here any good. Um, but if you feel like you're in control of your environment and you feel like you understand your environment and you feel confident in being able to predict its behavior under relatively normal situations, you're probably pretty good in, in, in a pretty good stance. Um, in terms of security, there's the obvious things. The FBI is not calling you anymore. Um, <laughs> or, or, you know, you're, you're not, it's hard to explain. There, there, there's other things that can happen, you know, getting DDoSed is, is a great example from the olden days. Um, that kind of thing, if you're attracting attention and you're, you're, the load on your web server is really high because you see just, loads and loads and loads of weird looking HTTP um, sessions coming in, you're probably got a problem. You know, that's something that just doesn't feel right. Why would I be getting hammered like this? Um, it, it, the other thing to do is, you know, ask for other people's opinions. Security is subjective. And so having other people tell you, yeah, that looks right, that doesn't look right, is, is a good way to fly as well. I'm glad we're closing on inventory instead of logs. Um, but I was curious if you had some practical advice as to how you manage inventory in an auto-scaling environment. If we're moving from pets into herd mentality, how do we how do you manage inventory? Yeah, so I was actually thinking about that. Thank you for bringing that up because um, I was actually thinking about this just the other day. So we don't have pets. We name pets. We love pets. We keep them around forever. We have herds. We don't have herds. We don't have wild buffalo roaming on the plains. We have cattle. If you look at the way we deal with cattle, they'll have ear tags. We know when one goes missing. We know when one needs you know, medicine or what stage it is in progression to market. Forgive the, you know, the, the cattle's way of looking at that. But, but that's the way it, it works. So in terms of inventory, practical and how to do it, um, rely on your deployment mechanisms. De rely on basics, like counting the number of containers you have running in production. It should never change unless you do something. It should never go down. It should, God forbid, it never go up, unless it's auto-scaling, in which case you know when action was taken. So measure it. Um, the, beyond that, um, you know, I, 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 I'm the wrong person to ask about actual how to do it like with salt or whatever i'm the wrong person to ask but you know i'm sure someone's got ideas but pay attention know what should be there at the you know inventory inventory is more than just an actual kind of what you've got it's you you know what should be there and and you know what basically what condition it should be in use that to measure build measurements and metrics for it all right we have one more question and then i'm going to ask the last question uh -oh. uh, a lot of the, the different items you went through seem um, reactive. Yes. Like how, how quickly you can recover from issues when they pop up. Uh, where's the proactive side? Where does that fit in? The inventory? Is that it? I mean, no. so I'm thinking of so like, you know, a lot of teams do agile teams. Like where's security with them? Is it something where it's baked into the process somehow? I mean, it's a human. So, problem. the let me let me. So one part of that might be what um, static code analysis tools should the teams just be running continuously related to. So, I'm not a fan of static code analysis. I think it's, I think your time is better spent going to a class, learning secure coding, go to SANS or something where they teach that kind of thing. It's it's a methodology of thinking. I'm not a big fan of them. Your mileage may vary. I'm, it's simply my opinion. In terms of the proactive work that you can do, understand your environment, 
understand your process, understand how you are going to approach things. It's how you approach it that matters. That's the proactive. Is nothing to do with the tech. Zero. It's how you, the human being, approach the work. That's the proactive part. It, it is the only part, in my experience, the human coming at things in a disciplined, methodical way that makes the difference. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question. And it's, in fact, about this slide, or about this concept, anyway. Because I keep looking at this, and God help us, I'm thinking about Rumsfeldian quadrants. You know, I'm thinking, huh, all right, all of those unknown unknowns are a hard problem. But you've also talked a lot about gaining more knowledge. Um, I'm wondering if you can leave us with your best advice about, hey, you would like to know about the things so that you can protect them. What's your, what's your best advice, best approach for how do we know things about our systems with all their emergent properties and complexity? Start simple, really. Um, you know, start with the basics, start with the things that are immediately in front of you. Um, the rest of it is pretty much what is important to you. Everyone's got a different, you know, a, a different take. Uh, too many slides to go back through, sorry. It's subjective. The, um, pick what's important to you, and, but start with the basics. Is the system up and down? Do I know how many systems there's supposed to be? Do I know what the system does in, in some detail? And everything else is subjective. All right, thank you so much, Paul. Can we give it up for Paul Douglas? Thank you.